Good to see you all at the 11 o'clock. My name is Vanessa. I am one of the co-leaders of our beta discipleship course, which starts in two weeks. For anybody woo, who is interested in learning more about our core issues of theology, how to read the Bible and study the Bible, or maybe just inject a bit of energy and freshness in your Bible study, come join us. Today's teaching text comes from Luke 6, verses 39 and 40. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. This is the word of God. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it's good to see you. We are starting a new series today called The Way of Jesus. And this is a series on discipleship what it really means to follow Jesus. And um, I, I want to just sort of frame where we're going to go for the next 10 weeks today. So today's a little bit of an overview, but honestly, it's a pretty probing one. It is a probing overview into the way that you are living. I got to spend last year a couple of days with one of my spiritual heroes. Uh, he was mentored by John Wimber directly for years. Then he was mentored by Dallas Willard, and which is, if you know who those people are, it's kind of like quite strong. <laughs> and I was, just, I was just talking to him about, about his reflections, and he just let out a little phrase, and it's a phrase that has haunted me ever since he said it. We're talking about being careful in how we live and leadership life and mistakes, and he said this, it's very hard to get life right. It's hard to get life right. William Irvine, who was a Stoic philosopher, has a concept which I've thought about over the years since I read his book called Misliving. He says, it is, it is really possible in the modern world, in spite of all of your best efforts, in spite of self-care and self-help, in, in spite of goals and soul cycle and um, paleo bowls or I don't know what the kids are reading, but, you know, sweet green or what, like in spite of all the things, you can live the wrong life. So the question you have to ask is, who are you trusting to lead you into the right life? Well, in this parable, Jesus says that you need a leader with the right vision. He says here, can the blind lead the blind? will they not both fall into a pit? And so, I want to address today the two pits that most people fall into when it comes to misliving. And then I just want to make the case at the end of why the path of life that Jesus leads us on is really the path that you are after. So, the first one, the first pit is the way of the world. The second one is the way of religion. And the third one is the way of Jesus. So, let's look at what Jesus warns us about here, the way of the world. Probably the classic verse when it comes to worldliness or the world is 1 John 2, 15. And it says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, the word that's used here, cosmos, has a wide meaning, so I, I want to just say what it's not. God created the world, and He said it was very good. The created order, nature, it's, it's beautiful. It's a gift from God. So He's not talking about that. And He's not talking about people. Worldliness is not people. People are made in the image of God, and regardless of their trust in Him or faith or religious practice, they matter to Him. He says that people are very good in terms of their value in the sight of God. So what's he talking about when he talks about the world? He's talking about the human system that is opposed to God. This is how Dallas Willard puts it. It's our cultural and social practices that are under the control of Satan and thus opposed to God. So look at these phrases, cultural and social practices that are opposed to God. It's the fallen human system. Paul describing people's state before Christ in Ephesians 2 says this, as for this, you would, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, 
when you, quote, followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So if you've ever been in one of those environments, cultural practices, cultural influence, and there just seems to be a spirit behind it and you just get swept up into it, like going down to Panama Beach at springtime or something like that, there's just a spirit. And if you're not careful, you get swept up into it. It says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And that means like you think what you want, you get what you want, you do what you want. It says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. I think the world is defined by two things, rebellion against God and an ingratitude for what it is that He has done for us. This is what it says in the book of Romans, when it talks about the great slide into spiritual danger. It says, they did not acknowledge Him as God or give Him thanks. So don't recognize Him and you're not grateful for Him, which ultimately leads to sort of self-definition and entitlement. I'm going to do what I want and I'm not going to be grateful or acknowledge God as the source of all of this. When the Apostle John is articulating this, he gives three distinctives of the way of the world. The first one is like the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Galatians 5. Now, the deeds of the flesh. So, what's he talking about? Well, Paul's like, let, let's obvious. Let me describe it for you. Immorality. And I want you to think about, again, my definition of the world. It's, it's the culture and practices opposed to God. And then I want to ask you how much the, what I'm about to list sounds like life in New York City, okay? So, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Someone outburst of angered me today while I was coming here. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I warned you that as I also forewarned you, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, if you buy into the spirit of the culture and the world, the love of the Father is not in you and you won't inherit the kingdom of God. It's the lust of the flesh. We are not just biological beings, we are spiritual beings. And if we just let like our lusts, our biology, our emotions, our drives dictate our lives... It's going to cause spiritual distortion and destruction. That's the lust of the flesh. Then he talks about the lust of the eyes. This is basically about covetousness. This is, says, I don't care what the boundaries are. I'm going to get what I want. I think of two examples from the Old Testament. The first one is, is Achan, Achan's sin in Joshua chapter 7. And you may be familiar with this passage, but God said to the children of Israel when they were coming into the promised land, particularly in one city, God wanted to consecrate it as the first place for himself. But Achan sees something he wants, and he takes it, and he hides it, and he says this. When I saw, verse 21, Joshua 7, when I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them, and they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. And what that means is you see something that you know you shouldn't have, but you covet it and you want it. Now, you may not even have an apartment floor you can dig up and stash stuff in, but it's possible to put it in your heart. Hidden below your religious practice and your participation and your hands raised in worship, you've taken something that is not yours that you want. You've hidden it in your heart. And it's sort of that coveting. That is the lust of the eyes. Same thing happened with David and Bathsheba. In the Old Testament, the kings had two jobs. And they were to lead the people out and they were to bring them in. So it says this about Moses, when Moses could no longer lead the people out and bring them in, Joshua was appointed. And Solomon's great prayer for wisdom was based on the fact, he, he says this, I am but a child and I don't know how to lead the people out and bring them in. And the goal of leadership is to bring people out for mission in the world, lead them out for mission and then bring them in for worship. And that's the rhythm of leadership. And David, who was the best in Israel's history at that, warrior, poet, worshiper. But in this moment, what's he doing? Everyone's out fighting the battle, and he's not in the temple. He's forgotten his own theology. One thing I desire, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. 
This time, he's not, he's not leading him out. He's not bringing him in. He's on a roof, and he sees an attractive woman. And instead of gazing on the beauty of the Lord, he gazes on the beauty of somebody else's life, wife. And what does he say? I want her. Bring her to me. And that's that, that's that covetousness, the lust of the eyes that says, give me. And look, Bathsheba here, what agency does she have? She's in a city filled with women, but one man who is the king. Everyone's gone. And the king says, come. If you don't come, here, the power of life and death. He knew he shouldn't, but he did. And that's what the lust of the eyes does. And then there's the pride of life. This is elevating yourself above God and above other people. I will, I will, I will. This is the sovereignty of self. Satan is behind all of these core lusts. It's the way of the world. It's the original sin. Did God really say? She saw the fruit. She saw that it was good, and she wanted it, and she took it, and she said, I want to be like God. That same whisper, the whisper of the world, is in this city, and it's appealing to your heart. When we live in the flesh and we're just driven by sensuality, we stop functioning like image bearers and we just act like animals on instinct. And when our eyes are filled with covetousness, we seek to have more than other people and even have other people. And when pride is in our heart, we arrogantly attempt to dethrone God from the universe and be little mini-gods in Manhattan. And what Jesus is saying is this, the worldly blind lead the worldly blind into a pit of despair. If you follow the leadership of the world, the way of the world, you will end in a pit of despair. And here's why, because you were made for an intimate relationship with God. And when you give in to the way of the world, you're not abandoning theology or ideas or a book called the Bible, you're abandoning a person. And so James frames all sin not purely as the breaking of the moral law or commandments, but adultery against the one who loves you. So he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he's caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? God is jealous for our affection And he does not want us to end in the worldly pit of despair. And I just want to say this to you. This can happen to you. At the end of his life, Paul's talking to Timothy and he says this, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Now, the reason this is so so jarring is if you do a little study on who Demas was and who Demas' crew was, if you saw who was leading and involved in Demas's community group, you would say there's no way that a person with that many good leaders around him, doing what he's done, seeing what he's seen, could ever deny Jesus. But it says he's gone to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a sweet spot. And he just said, you know what, it's not worth it. And so we cashed it all in. And I, I tell you, it is my job as a pastor, just like honestly in love, what I don't want to happen is that you come here with sincere faith and you get distracted, you get lonely, you get seduced by the city, and then the phrase is, Katie, because she loved New York, has abandoned Jesus. Or Stephen, because he cared more about the incentives of his firm than the kingdom of God, has abandoned Jesus. This can be dramatic, it can be big things. It can be someone just like denies their faith or has an affair or just blows up their life. And and I've seen my fair share of that, but mainly it's not like dramatic, it's a drift. It's very, very slow. And what ends up happening is the way of the world, it's institutions, stories, practices, they just just do a number on you. They just work you over slowly. And if you keep following it over the course of time, you get habituated to the practices and values of the culture. And then you wake up one day and you just feel like, where did God go? Jesus says this, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Can you hear Jesus' love? I can tell you, I've sat with people who traded their soul for the world, and I've sat with many people weeping, going, I would give anything to get my soul back. The worldly blind leading the worldly blind into a pit of despair. 
So I think one of the overreactions is like, we better be really good then. Better be really good. Uh-uh. That's the way of religion. The way of religion is a trap. Jesus gets stuck into religious people. Now, look, there's a whole, a whole sociology of religion. This is an intro week. I can't get into it all. But Jesus seems to indicate that religion that he's opposed to is defined by an external focus without an inward reality. Matthew 15, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And then when the religious people, so just like, to be clear here, just like the worldly system is the culture and practices under the power of the evil one, the religious system is the culture and practices under the control of hypocrites. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, I want to pause for a second here. The New Testament is making the claim that Jesus is God on earth. So here is God stepping into the human story, walking around, observing what we've done with his world. And then when he looks at the religious people who are supposed to be like representing God, Jesus is not impressed with what they have done with his truth. And imagine now God critiquing how you do your religion and hearing these words, woe to you teachers of the law and hypocrites, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you succeed, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Jesus is like, your discipleship is a disaster, and your mission turns people into sons of hell. This can get in the New Testament church. Paul says to the Corinthians, your gatherings do more harm than good. There's a way to do religion, it's a culture and it's practices that actually distort people rather than bless people. And that's why it can be so disillusioning. People can be in church all their lives and never change. People can be in leadership and not look like Jesus. When I was living in Texas, I was attending Bible college there. Um, I was there for as short a time as possible. Um, And one of the jobs I had was uh, working for an electrician who was one of the elders. So basically, he basically had these long levels of pipe and he had to bend the pipe. If you're from Texas, get over it. If you have to bend the pipe, bend the pipe so that you could feed uh, electric cables through it. And this guy was an elder up the front, and he was like, you know, clapping his hands and jumping up and down and shouting in tongues, glory, glory, glory. And then when I went to work with him. I was like, this guy's a freaking jerk. He was, a jer- he was mean. He was condescending, so disrespectful, dismissive of, dismissive of me, cruel. I just remember thinking, oh, I don't, I don't think the people in church know who you are. And I ended up quitting I didn't want anything to do with this. This is what David Ben said, and and here's the truth. Often people are religious, not because they think they need God, because they're trying to control God. Religion is an attempt to deal with the disaster of the human condition by manipulating the divine. David Benner, fearful people live with restrictive boundaries. People who live in fear feel compelled to remain in control. They attempt to control themselves and they attempt to control the world. Often despite their best intentions, it spills over into efforts to control others. Fear also blocks responsiveness to others. The fearful person may appear deeply loving, but fear always interferes with the impulse towards love. Energy invested in maintaining safety and comfort always deplete energy available for the love of others. And I can tell you there's a lot of folks who think that their morality can fend off evil like a charm. What God's really after is dealing with our hearts. But what the Pharisees and what the religious culture settles for is just the elimination of bad behaviors. 
Robert Mulholland has a book on spiritual formation, and in it, in one part of the book, he talks about how God really tries to deal with our sins. And he says, it's basically on four levels, this is the work God does in us. Level number one is the renunciation of blatant sins, like we get the big stuff out. And he's like, you know if you're doing this. But then there's the renunciation of willful disobedience, which is like, you know what, I don't want to do that, I shouldn't do that. So it's like, oh gosh, I got to get that out of here, followed by, I shouldn't do that. But then underneath that, there is unconscious sins and omissions. And then deep down, there's the deep-seated structures of being and behavior. And they cause these trust structures, the things that we really believe that we're not even aware we're trusting in. Next slide here. If you could split these two things, what you're going to see is that the religious system is satisfied with the top two levels. Get rid of the big, obvious, bad behaviors but it's not interested in God getting into our hearts and changing the kinds of people we really are. And I want to say this to you, it's very, very important here. If you get to this point when you think because you're not doing big sins, you're doing what God wants, and this is the goal of the Christian life, you're in for a startling surprise. Your journey has just begun. And at this point, more activity for God is not going to do a thing but turn you into a worse person. At this point, more content is only going to puff you up. And at this this point, more hyped up events are not going to change you. And often what ends up happening in hyped up events is what's being activated in the brain is just a combination of dopamine and adrenaline. I'm telling you, I have felt the glory of God at Bon Iver in Brooklyn as much as I have at all night prayer and worship. At least my body felt the same thing. You get yourself in an environment where everybody feels something and there's a shared energy. And a lot of kids, when they leave big, hyped-up environments, feel like they've lost the presence of God. They haven't. They're just not accessing the chemicals in their brain anymore. They were never trained how to interact with the presence of God. They were relying on externals. Now, if you know me, you know I love a hyped-up event. I think part of my job is to be a hype man for Jesus. I mean, like, I love this stuff. But I'm just letting you know that when God wants to change your heart, environments, content, religious activity will not work. This is how Keller puts it. They build their sense of worth on their moral and spiritual performance as a kind of resume to present before God and the world. The moral and spiritual standards of all religions are very high, and Pharisees know deep down They're not fully living up to those standards. They're not praying as often as they should. They're not loving and serving their neighbor as much as they should. They're not keeping their inner thoughts as pure as they should. The resulting internal anxiety, insecurity, and irritability will often be much greater than anything experienced by the irreligious. So, like, when when you're just like, let's go with the world, that's really good until it's not good. But religion's kind of miserable all the time. It's like low-grade shame and frustration. The prodigal son on the way out from the father's house, when the wallet was full and Vegas odds were good, having fun. And then it hits all at once. But the religious are miserable all the time, joyless, irritable. Jesus did not say, I've come that you may follow the rules. He said, I've come that you may have life. And religious people put this up instead of offering their hearts to God. The religious blind leading the religious blind into a pit of vipers. Well, what's the alternative? It's the way of Jesus. Jesus, again, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both... Lead, fall into a pit. The student's not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. What Jesus is telling us is that his vision is to train us to be like him. So this means that it's not about trying to be good and it's not about doing whatever you want. It's learning to live in God's world, God's way. And it's all built on trust and love. That's the beauty of the gospel. The world promises you can do whatever you want without consequence and it'll lead to fulfillment, and it doesn't. And religious people say, if you do everything right, you'll finally feel like you're good enough and you're worth something in the world. And Jesus just says, you are a total freaking mess and I love you anyway. 
He really sees us, and this is what we want. We want someone to see us for who we really are, to be vulnerable, to be fully naked, but we want to be loved and not rejected. And it's only Jesus who sees us in all of our sin, all of our dysfunction, all of our brokenness, all of our rebellion, and says, I love you anyway, and then dies on the cross in our place to take away our punishment, to take away our need to perform, and He gives us His love as an act of grace. It's about trust and love. It's about Jesus' life. It's about His care. It's about His sacrifice. It's about His resurrection, and it's about union with Him in the innermost being. And when we're connected to Him through grace, being born again, it says that we're renewed into the image of the Creator. So at the heart of the universe is a true one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a community of love, and then there's us being welcomed in by the grace of God. And it's learning to believe that story, and it's learning to learn from Jesus how to enter into that and how to work that out. So ultimately, the way of Jesus is not about the way of pleasure or religion. It's about our deep transformation on the inside. It's about our formation. Spiritual formation is the process by which our inner self and character are shaped. So to go back to that chart that Mulholland puts up, Robert Mulholland puts up, if you go to the next slide here, you can see, no, that's, I think that's it. Uh, On the bottom there, you see those two things, unconscious sins and omissions, deep-seated structures of being and behavior. That's when God really gets in there and He says, I'm going to change not just what you do externally, but internally, I'm going to give you that new covenant heart and make you who you were destined to be. And that that can be very, very hard. It can be very hard. Our coping mechanisms, our practices, our habits, the things we do to avoid pain, regret, to fend off the danger of the world can be so deeply ingrained. They can be unconscious in us. And when Jesus begins to poke at those things, it can feel like your inner life is unraveling. Well, Jesus, what will I do if I don't respond like that? And so a lot of people just revert back to moralism, but he says, no, let me bring you into union with me. Trust, let me give you a new power and a new way of relating in the world. Richard J. Foster says this, the aim of it is not external conformity, whether to doctrine or deed, but the reformation of the inner self, of the spiritual core, the place of thought and feeling, of will and character. Behold, cries the psalmist, you desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Or create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. It is the inner person that is being renewed day by day. And so the way of Jesus at a foundational level has three goals. Number one, it's to be formed. Galatians 4.19 says, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. The Galatian church that was, uh, had been planted with a revelation of the gospel and signs and wonders done in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Galatians 1 says. But then the Galatians got tricked into following the religious blind. And they they said, hey, the Jesus stuff's fine, but what you really need to do is observe the law. And Paul literally says, foolish Galatians, what has bewitched you? It's like someone's put a spell on you. Like, did, did you get changed because you did stuff for God or because the Spirit came inside of you? and renewed you, and then worked wonders among you. And so, the, so Paul's prayer then is like, look, you have within you, when you are united with Christ and born again, staggering spiritual potential. The DNA of a, a person in the kingdom of God is extraordinary. And Paul's prayer is that it would be actualized, that it would move from theological knowledge or mental assent to transformation of the inner life. So that's his vision. His prayer is that, you know, as people who are pregnant with divine possibilities, the goal is that that would be birthed out into the world through us. The goal is to be formed. And then secondly, once we know what the vision is, we have to be transformed because all of the formation that's happened to us has primarily deformed us. We are so subtly shaped. You know, sociologists sociologists tell us, that if you move to New York within a year, you will walk faster than people in other places. Like the literal pedestrian rate of speed of a New Yorker is faster than other places. Your speech will increase in speed. 
You ever, you ever been in a conversation with someone and they're like, look, I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm really in a hurry. Hurry up. Let's get this. Get it all sorted out. And you go, thank God, a New Yorker. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Done. Move on. It's like, that's a form of kindness. It's a form of kindness. People who are born here that are just like, Brr, I'm like, you are my people. The number one thing I've heard my entire life is slow down when you speak. I'm like, hurry up when you listen. <laughs> we, are, we are formed by the environment around us in small, small ways, but in deep ways. We're formed to think just like the normalization of everything ungodly. Just normal. Calm down. So we have to be transformed. That's the Romans 12 verse, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, it's His mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. So the world has a pattern, it has practices, it has values, it has habits that slowly shape us. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. And His will is good, His will is better than good, it's pleasing better than pleasing. It's perfect. This word is metamorpho, from where we get the term metamorphosis. It's like the radical transformation from one thing into another. It's the idea of, of like the caterpillar worm thing becoming a butterfly. It's like, how does that happen? Well, like it's, it's these things called imaginary cells inside of them, just like, like little miracle cells. And when the cocoon goes on and when they struggle and they break out, they just become different creatures. So we're called to be formed we're called to be transformed out of the image and patterns of the world into those of the kingdom of God. And then we're called to be conformed, conformed to the image of Jesus. This is our ultimate goal. Romans 8 says this, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who've been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So Jesus is the first of what the new humanity is look, going to look like. And your destiny is to become like Him. Those He predestined, He called. Those He called, He justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. The word here is somorphizo. It means to have the same form as another. Literally means like the personality of Jesus will be manifest through your life. And we're to image Christ as the firstborn and we become like Him. And honestly, what would the world look like if it was filled with people like Jesus? You know what that's called? That's called the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where people who are becoming like Jesus let His rule and reign, His habits and His practices and His will create a different culture than the culture of the world. We are called to be led by Jesus who can see clearly through the disaster of both religion and the disaster of worldliness into the path of life. And I'm telling you, this life is good. This life is about freedom. This is a life of joy. It's not a life of shame and hiding. It's not a life of regret for what you've done. It renews our mind. The propaganda of the world is replaced with truth that sets us free. It renews our relationship. We go from consumers of other people's energy and vitality into people who sacrificially give to build them up. It changes our habits from just reactive to proactive consciously asking us who we're becoming. We go from giving into the flesh, which just feels like cycles of despair, to walking in the Spirit that restores our confidence and our authority. We move from a world that's just flat and flattened out with God being present, in, with God being absent, to people who live in a world loaded with spiritual possibility because the Spirit could move anywhere at any time because the wind blows where it wills. We have a sacred tapestry, we have divine encounter, we have new spirits, new heart, new power, and a new life. We're no longer doing justice or good in the world as a form of virtue signaling or self-righteousness, judging other people who don't care like we care about what we care about. Instead, we learn to bless and intervene and to love and to heal. And when you get enough people in a community like this, it begins to confront and transform, not just individuals, but the culture of the world in which it lives. And so, just to ask you this morning, I mean, next week I'm going to preach like a banger of a text on the good news of self-denial. And they've got another great one after that on why it's good news to like hate your family and all of that. 
But before we really get into Jesus' way of formation, I just wanted to ask this morning, have you, are you giving careful thought to your ways? Are you committed to getting life right? Is it the desire of your heart to be led by someone who can see so that you don't fall into the pit? Give careful thought to your ways, the way of the world or the way of religion or the way of Jesus. And there's a passage in the book of Haggai, that's where this phrase comes from, give careful thought to your ways, where you've got the children of Israel who are so consumed with their own personal projects, returning from exile and establishing themselves, that they forget about God's kingdom, God's glory, and God's temple. And so God just tells them, all of your efforts at self-actualization without a priority to my ki- commitment to my kingdom will result in futility. And let me tell you, New York is a hard place to feel like what you're doing is futile. This is what he says. It's not futile for the kids. <laughs> I want to get me down to that kids' church. <laughs> this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but you see it turned out to be a little. What you brought home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house which remains in ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. And it's just, it's just God saying, look, how can I bless you with kingdom life when you're giving your energy and focus onto the way of the world or the way of religion? Give careful thought to your ways. And so I just want to ask you today, seriously, is there... If the root of worldliness is rebellion or an ingratitude, it's the lust of the flesh, it's the lust of the eyes, it's the pride of life. Honestly, is there any of that in your heart? Have you taken something and hidden it in your heart and it's just sitting there like a can? Have you overstepped a boundary like David, consciously violated not what you know God doesn't want you to do and you've said, I don't care, it's just the way of the world, I want it. I want to just tell you this. We have 2,000 years of church history showing what happens when you follow the way of the world. We get stories in this city of what happens when you follow the way of the world. What makes you think you're any different than these other people? The big lie is that it's going to work out fine. It won't. So maybe this is a morning where God wants to save you from spiritual disaster by giving you space to repent of the way of the world. The thing about Jesus is like when you are repentant before Jesus, He's so merciful. If you come in pride, God will resist you. But if you come in humility, God gives grace to the humble. And if you've been caught up in worldliness in this last season, something's got in your heart, it's buried and it's hidden and you're faking it, you're smiling, but you're like, dang, I did not think He was preaching about this and God's got me. You can have freedom from that this morning. The grace of God can come in cleanse you, set you free. we got folks over here, they love to be able to pray for you. Sometimes it's helpful just to confess it. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. And there is just like a healing power in getting it out and receiving God's grace. So I want to urge you today, don't think, no, 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 I'm just going to take care of it myself. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to let it in. You're going to, you're going to sin again. That's a hidden cycle of shame. Bring it into the light and find freedom. And maybe you're here and actually your struggle is like, it's actually a religious struggle. Maybe like the reason you're so controlling and fearful and judgmental is that you're terrified that you're not enough and you can't do enough. Some of the busiest people in church are the most insecure people in their spirits because they're trying to prop up their inadequacies by doing things for God. And what you need to know is like there's nothing you can do to make God love you any more or any less. That's the beauty of the gospel. He loves you as you are. And so maybe some of you, like, you realize, gosh, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. Like, I literally am using God as a kind of, like, deal with heaven to fend off my anxiety rather than trusting and loving Him. 
The beauty of the gospel is Jesus ate with sinners, but we forget he also ate with Pharisees. Like he, he invited people in who were caught up in religion and he wants to give you life. So if you've wandered from Jesus and the world's got its hooks in you, come and find freedom today. And if you've been practicing a form of religion that's been killing your spirit and judging other people and you'd really like to meet the beauty of the grace of Jesus, I'd love to pray for you today. Now, some of you may be saying, well, no, no, like I, I need you to go deeper. Like I'm actually interested in formation. I need you to want to make this more practical. Come back next week. This is the introductory week. We're just getting started here. But I don't want to rush into that without creating space for those lower levels, the secret places of the heart to be brought into the light. So can we all stand together in response? And I just want us to ask God to come and do an MRI. You ever had an MRI? It's not good if you're claustrophobic. In fact, it's just not good. It's not good. But what it does is it gets in you and it can see things that you can't see on your own. And it can save you. And it can be terrifying to just be like, like in, tubed up, just like sitting there like, oh gosh, and this, you're getting scanned. But that is an act of love. That technology is a gift. I believe it was invented by a Christian. The goal of it is to see, is there anything that's stopping you right here? And so if you sense this morning that there's something in your heart around worldliness of religion, I want to encourage you to respond to it. You can respond any way you want. Maybe you just want to put your hands out in worship and just say, Lord, here I am. I just offer myself to you. Maybe it's confession. We've got folks on the prayer team that love to be able to pray for you. Maybe it's turning to a neighbor or a friend who brought you and just saying to them, would you pray for me? But it would, be, it would just be an exercise in futility to get up here and talk about all of this and then agree in our minds and walk out and be the exact same people. God's here. He loves you. He wants to change you and renew you and set you free. Let's surrender to His love and let's do this together as a community. Amen.